like I'm out of it now, right? Like you guys are out of it, right? Like we were, we were in it, we were going, you know, like there's just firing all cylinders, and then you're just like. I think we should go back to that COVID semester one where we where we end. Where we ended. So the only problem is like you you give up two weeks. Started, in, we, no, we, we lost one week, I think, and we should just started a week even thought, sooner than that. We yeah. all started at the beginning of August. You had two yeah. months home. You would. I'd rather have a month yeah. off to ski than a month off. Yeah, but the skiing's not even the skiing's not even going right now. Like it's but bad it skiing. It'd be like it'd be like go home, come back, and then come back when skiing is like open. Or just like take. See what you can do. I don't know. I, like what you can do. I, like I don't know. I'm just out of it. Why is there nobody here? But I think almost everybody is here. It feels like nobody's here. It feels like it. It feels oh, like Jacques it. Gone. Jacques is gone. Password. He's what? He took the elevator. He took the elevator. We walked the building at the same time. He's got to come walking down here. He has to walk downstairs to get over here. Password elevator. Yeah, well, he's already missed like every password. <laughs> so, other extra credit related thing, the course evaluations are for you doing extra credit for that. Yeah, one? yeah, I'll do. Yeah, we'll throw it. If we hit, if we hit a hundred percent, a hundred percent course evaluate, filling out the course evaluations, then then I'll throw I'll throw I'm something on the final. You down. Yeah, hundred percent. So when we say the project's goal, it's a steep goal. Well, there's only fifteen of you, right? Or right? you should be able to hit that. Threaten the people person. around you. So, if, so yeah, on, I think you can access it just through D2L. Then there's a little link you can click to fill out an evaluation. Oh. Oh. Wow. I heard you took the elevator, Jacques. <laughs> <laughs> you came in the same time as the manager. You've been here for five minutes. <laughs> Two we have three weeks till the final. Two and a half weeks till the final. How are you we did Monday. Monday. days? Like, we're we're starting on Monday. Though. Oh wait, it is on Monday. Two weeks. Two Monday. weeks. You, you got it. You'll be fine. What you it's only half your grade that? that's still pulling out. <laughs> 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 yeah. What? So we have one homework, super easy. We're gonna it, we're at homework, super easy, and then honestly, in the next couple of days, we're gonna be done with notes, and then just. And but we'll and then we're gonna have a couple of guest speakers and then we have like half of an assignment. So most of your time is gonna be working on your do, deal and your other thing. Do yes. we have like work days in class for the project? We might if we finish all the stuff. You guys quit complaining and let me <laughs> lecture. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you guys be quiet, let me finish these lecture notes. When are you posting that homework? Uh, I can post it today. Yeah, it, it, like I said, it's not it's not bad. What are we? Yeah. Okay. What are we presenting projects next Friday? Next Friday. Okay. See you next Friday. Cool. See you next Friday. Cool. You guys just had a week that you enjoyed. Yeah, as a should have. It turns out that's not my like fault. Chop wood, man. There you go. Chop wood, all right. You know he helped me chop wood, so he's he's throwing yeah. some. He's calling on a favor. Okay, so here we are. Let's get back in this. Let's get back in this. This is scary, right? So we did modal analysis, right? And the idea behind this modal analysis is we break out into, into the modes. It decouples the system when we're in modal space. We solve the problem in the decoupled modal space. I thought you were knitting, Amanda. <laughs> you I had a student once that would knit during class. I swear, yep. You just, I, I post my notes afterwards. You just knit and listen. I don't know and how to knit. I know how to crochet. Do you think about doing it during class sometimes? <laughs> Keep it entertained. So you go into the modal space, you solve it in modal space, and you bring it back. We, we got into this pretty convoluted, that we introduced this idea of this S matrix, which is kind of a breakdown of a, 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 a distribution of a time-changing part. We applied that. Uh, or anyways, we're in the middle of that. And we, we're in this decoupled system. We introduced this new variable, gamma, and, and uh, D is in there, is what that Q is going to be. And we worked our way through, and all, you ended up with gamma on both sides of the equation. And then what you end up with this is you have a differential equation, three different differential equations, because you have it for each mode, or however many modes you deal with. Multiple modes, multiple degrees of uh, 
however many degrees of freedom you have is the number of modes you have. You, they're all equal to the same forcing function. You solve that, right? And then you combine it afterwards. Now, we then applied it to the ground shaking. When you apply it to ground shaking, you got to follow the same process, and you get down to this is the differential equation that you have to solve inside the mode, right? You're inside the mode. You want to solve this thing. So you do this for mode one, mode two, mode three, mode four, mode five, however many degrees of freedom you have, you solve this. This, to solve this differential equation, there's a couple of different ways you can do. You could do it, and then once you solve that, then you have to go back into real, to the real world. But there's two different methods, right? There is, when you're solving that differential equation, you solve it for every single time step. That's called the time history analysis, okay? Or what the, what the code calls response history analysis. You will give these ground accelerations, then you slip in the central difference method inside of your regular code. So there's an extra credit homework in there if you want to do it, which is you, you, you're you inside your code that you did for just free vibration and force vibration. You get inside there, and then you just change your equation for Q to the central difference method, and then, right, or in this case, it'll be your equation for D, and then you solve for your D for every single time step. And then you do that for each one of the, each one of the, uh, uh, modes, they all have different periods, right? And you solve each one of those things and then you bring it back into the real world. That's the time history, so you have every single time step. The other way to do it, over here, okay, is the solution to that equation up there, instead of solving it for each one of these periods, that's already done. That's, what's, that's what a response vector has done. That's what you, you've made one of these in, in uh, your codes where you went through and you changed your periods and then you pulled off the maxes, <coughs> which then made this response vector. And so you could just use the response vector as the answer over here. So you go to period one, read up what that is, period two, read up what that is, period three, read up what that is, and then you have the pseudo acceleration for each one of the modes. So then that can be turned into the displacements, which is just A over omega, uh, A over omega squared. You do that for each one of those modes. Once you get that D, then you multiply it by gamma, it gives you Q, you then multiply that by phi, and it gives you U. And then in this case, though, this will just be scalars. Right, because you, you're not doing it every single time step. Over here, you're doing it every single time step and combining. Over here, it's just a value, a value, and a value. There's just three scalars. And so this just ends up with three scalars. Then you can calculate the forces of just being k times the u you get from here. And then given those forces, you can then calculate the responses. Right? The thing that comes a little bit weird there is combining the modes. You can't just add them together because this guy, this guy, and this guy all happened at different times, right? You can see over here, like, here's one for T1, T2, and T3. They all happened at different times, so you can't just add them together. So there's other methods for adding them together, and that is SQRS, square root of the sum of the squares, or the complete quadratic combination, right? And so in, inside of, you know, will you be doing this by hand in the real? No, right? You're going to be using a program to do this, right? VA or... or or RAM or something like that. And then inside there, they usually give you control on which method you want to use for solving this. SQS, SQRSS or uh, complete quadratic combination. And so you'll know what those things mean. Right? It has to do with combining the modes. Okay, so equivalent forces and modal masses. That's the next one here. Okay, so... Inside of each mode, I mentioned this before, you have to be careful of the pitfall. We'll, we'll, we'll write that down in a second. But if I want to calculate the forces for each mode, I just do K times my U's from that mode, right? My U's are 4, 1, 4, 2, and 4, 3. I just multiply it by my stiffness matrix, and it gives me these forces, right? Uh, F2, 1, and F1, 1. So the first, second number is the mode. The first number is the floor. And so this is mode, so this is mode 1, and this is mode 2. And so you can get those forces based on it. So then inside of here, I can then calculate the responses at different locations, right? I give it these forces, and I can calculate the moments, shears, axial loads, and any of these columns and stuff. And I can do that for each one of these things. If I wanted to calculate the base shear, so that's one way to do it. It's K times U. Or the other way you can do it is this S times A. That's another way to do it, that S of the mode times your pseudo acceleration, either one of those. This is equivalent to mass times acceleration over here. The units of S are actually in masses in mass, so it's a mass times pseudo acceleration or k times u, and that will give us these forces right here. Okay, so if I want to calculate, uh, oh, there's a couple of things here. 
Okay, so this S, right, I can calculate those forces as being S times A or K times U. If I do it as the S, this is how you calculate S. Right? Uh, gamma times M times V gives me S for that mode, and it gives me up the height, different S's. Or, and then so then my calculate my forces is to be gamma times M times V times A. And if I wanted to calculate the base shear, I calculate the base shear, it's pretty obvious here. If I want the base shear, I just add these things up. So if I want the base shear for mode one, V base one is just F21 plus F11. And if I want the base shear for mode two, that'll just be F22 plus F12. Right. I can just add, just add those base shears up that way. Or the other way you could do it is I can add my S's. So in this equation down here for this base shear, I should make note that I's are modes, J's equals floors. So it's pretty obvious this one, right? If I want uh, the base shear for mode I, I just add up my four Fs like I did up above. I just add those things up vertical, right? The other way I can do it is I can add up all my Ss vertically, okay? By adding up all my Ss vertically, that's what we're gonna call our modal mass. This right here. And that modal mass is called Mi star. This is right out of the book. Our S's also look like our S's also look like this, just to make it clear. But it, but they're in units of mass. We're gonna do an example. This is a, we're gonna do one example in this class. I don't think we've done a single example yet. We're gonna do an example. Right. So this would be S21, S11, one, one. and you'll have something like this. This would be S, or S22 two, two, rather. S12. Right, so you could do either, you could do it like this, I can use to sum up the vertical forces, or if I sum up my S's over here, then what I'm going to get out of it is M star, which is, which is considered the modal mass. Okay, so this is, this is the modal mass. We've talked about that briefly, or at least it's come up in our discussions before, what, uh, of... The code requires you use as many modes. Well, I'm going to write that down here. Let me see what it is. I'm going to write it down right. And then if you sum up all of your sum of all modal masses equal total mass, and you add them all up, the sum of all of them equals the total mass. And then the thing I wanted to say about this is the code specifies Code specifies that you need to use enough modes to reach effective modal mass equal to at least 90% of total mass. 
Right. So remember, you can pick how many modes you want to include. The more modes, I mean, there's as many modes as there are degree, degree, degrees of freedom. So there's a massive amount of modes. The more modes you use, the slower your model works. And so you want to use as minimum as possible. And the minimum you can use as possible is that your effective modal mass adds up to at least 90% of the total mass. Right? And again, we'll, do, we'll see this thing work out in, in, an, in the example. Okay. There's this pitfall we mentioned last time. Avoid the pitfall when combining modes with response spectra analysis. You lose the signs. Therefore, you need to look at response inside mode first, then combine. Okay. An example of this it would be base shear, for instance, right? If I was looking at base shear, just the way we talked about up above, right, I wouldn't want to combine my forces first, right? I wouldn't want to do this guy square root of the sum of the squares and this guy square root of the sum of the squares and then look for the base shear because you would lose the fact that this one's going to the right and that one's going to the left when you do the square root of the sum of the squares. And so you have to look base shear first for that mode, then base shear here for that mode, and then you add the, then you do the square root of the sum of the squares. It's still, the square root of the sum of squares is weird to begin with, but it gets even weirder if you, if you fall into that pitfall. Look inside the mode first, and then, and then go out to the, uh, look inside the mode first, and then combine them afterwards. <coughs> okay. Can you go back to what you wrote? Nope. Missed it. That's the pitfall. All right, we're going to do an example now and just kind of see it play out. Question in life decisions right now. You're like, what am, I do? what am I doing with my life? This <laughs> sucks. You doing right, Dawson? You got a little Fu Manchu going? Yeah, that's a little marked right there. Did you get in a fight? Yeah, I got in a fight. Did you really? For a stick. Oh. <laughs> what did you do? I fell. Were you, were you drinking, Dawson? No, not at all. Were you hunting or something? Or? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Here's the, we're, we're going to go through this, a three-story example. So this is the exact same building that you use for your homework, right? So this is a three-story building, right? You just, you just did a homework on this, but when we did the homework on this, we did free vibration, right? Just straight up. We're going to do now, we're going to do the response spectra analysis of this building for using the, I think the, the, he, is it the he, I think it's just the hell, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know which response spectra I used, I'm not sure which response spectra I used, uh, but we're going to use some, some response spectra, so here it is right here, okay, so the way you do this, you got to do the same, you start out these modal and multiple degree of freedom systems the same exact way, you have to make a stiffness matrix, a mass matrix, then you do I to K comma M, and it returns to you big phi and, and omega squares, right? So these are the, what you should have gotten for your homework answers there, right? So these are, these are, uh, you know, so we formulated our mass and stiffness matrix. We did I K comma M, and it gave us this big phi and this omega, big omega squared, right? Based off of, so this is going to be, this is what mode shape one, that's mode shape two, and that's mode shape three, and this is omega one squared, omega two squared, and omega three squared, right? And so then you then, from those omegas, you can then get these, right? And that's just two pi over omega i, All right? Ti yeah, is equal to two pi over omega i. That's all. That's all that's done there. Okay. 
And so that's what you should have gotten for your, for your homework problem. So now we have the periods and what the shapes are. Okay? So then we come over here and we look at the modal distribution of masses. Because now we're inside uh, Hunter. We're just doing, we're doing this example right here, which is the exact same building that you use for your homework. Okay? And then, so we just talked about the mass and stiffness matrix and the phi and stuff like that. So it all starts the same way. We just did free vibration with it before, and then now we're doing this modal response vector analysis. So in this case, our influence vector, iota, since this thing is simplified as a shear frame building, so it's just lateral displacements at the three different floors, they all line up with UG, right? So up here, this is UG double dot. Double dot is going this direction. Right? Back and forth in that direction. This is U1. This is U2. This is U3. Right? Of, each, each, of each one of those floors. So those displacements, they all line up with this. right? They perfectly are lined with those things. Or the, the degrees of freedom up above. So it makes sense that our iota down here is just 1, 1, and 1. Right, because they all the, all three degrees of freedom line up with the ground shaking underneath. So iota is one, one, and one. If I just take m times iota, right, our m is just that diagonal, and that essentially just pulls the diagonal off of it. So we get m, m, and m over two. And so there's what our s is. Okay, we then have to take that s and break it into its modal components. So this is what s is right here. That's just the masses, and we break it into its modal components. That's done right here. M times iota is M times phi times gamma. And then you can just flip that thing around to figure out what your gammas are. Right? Your gamma is phi to the negative 1, M to the negative 1 times M times iota. When you do that, that gives you your gammas. So these are my three gammas right here. The top one is gamma one, the next one is gamma two, and the next one is gamma three. So you basically solved all three gammas for each three of the modes. So now we got all three of those gammas, negative 0 0.738, 0 0.254, and negative 0.194. Those don't really mean anything to us, right? But they, they, we're gonna use them later. We need them to get into the modal components, right? This one's gonna go here, right? It, it, each one of these is gonna go in here mode, and it'll give us our S for each mode. So that's the next step here is calculating what our S is for each mode, right? S1 is going to be gamma 1 times M times phi 1, gamma 1, just that top value up there, which is negative 0.738, multiplied by your mass matrix. This is phi 1, which is just that first column of our big phi, and so this is what our S1 is. 0 0.114, 0 0.249, and 0 0.182, okay? And then you do the same thing for the second uh, second mode and third mode. It's so just that's for each floor. Yep. Mode one. Yep. Yep. This is for each floor mode one. I'm gonna draw them down here. And this is mode two each floor. Floor one, floor two, floor three, floor one, floor two, floor three for mode three. So I mean, according to this, the way we have this set up, our S is gonna be for mode one. Point one eight two. I always do this thing backwards, right? 0.249. This last one, 0.182, or 0.114. This is what S1 is. Right? S2 is going to be 0.0647. Actually, I drew all these wrong. These are, nope, I'm okay. Yep, I did them right. Okay. 0 0.0647. And this one is 0 0.647. Oh, yep, yep, I did it backwards. See, remember I said you guys always have problems with it? I always have problems with it. Actually, so this is going to be pointed the other way. And 0 0.0647, that's what that one is. All right, and the last one is 0 0.0, 0 
six, negative zero point zero five five. And zero point zero one two six. I know, I know, I need to do that. Did I do that wrong again? No. Oh, I did, yeah, I did. This is point oh eight zero two. That's S three R. And then if you add all those up, if you want, I mean, if you want to check, if I take. This guy plus this guy plus this guy, it should give us what the overall S is up above. It should, it, it should have worked out that way. Okay? So that is that, uh, what our S's are. Okay? So you could, if you were after like the axial loads and moments and stuff like that, you could, you could calculate what they are based off of these forces. I don't like to do it that way, so don't even pretend to even say that. So there's what our S's are. We've broken them into the different components. It's, it's just kind of a distribution of masses is what it is. It's a distribution of those masses and how they're affected by the earthquake and how, uh, uh, how they play out here. Okay, so, then we, so that's just kind of what our S's are. Then we, we can calculate the effective modal masses, right, which is just summing up in each mode I could sum these guys. That's one way to calculate it. I just add this guy plus this guy plus this guy, and that tells me the effective modal mass for mode one. So that's all this is. 0.144 plus 0.249 plus 0.182. And so it's point, what does that say? 0.545, right? And then I look at the effective modal mass for mode two, and that is, you just sum up for mode two. You add, do the same thing for mode two, you get 0 0.065, and M3, you get 0 0.038. Okay, so if I want to see what my total mass is, my M totes, is what I call it, I just add all three of those, all three modes up together, this guy plus this guy plus this guy, that gives me my total mass, which is 0 0.647, or I could go back to this mass and just add this guy plus this guy plus this guy, okay? because they they, each mode's modal mass will add up to the total modal mass. So that's the total modal mass is 0.647. So if I look at M1 star over M totes, right, that's 84.17%. So mode one accounts for 84.17% uh, of the mass, okay? This is where the code talks about. The code set, and then mode two is 0.065 divided by 0.647, which is 10%, and then mode three is 5.83%. So this is what the code says. You have to use as many modes as possible to get to 90%. So according to this, you would have to use two modes, right? You, if you use mode one, that's not enough. You're only up to 84%. But if you go to mode two, that adds you an extra 10%. So you're sitting at 94.17%, so you could stop there. So in your analysis, you would just do two modes, right? Because this last mode isn't really going to affect much because it's you know, it's significantly less. It's a lot more complicated than that, right? Because if you, if you remember when you did your model for the, uh, the overall, uh, for the big, the big assignment where you made the big thing, right? Then you were looking at mode one and mode two. Mode one was going one way and mode two was going the, was going the other way. So you have to use as many modes that you get 90% in each direction. So you would have to use, you know, and, and, and it was like mode one, and then like mode seven gave you the, is the rest of it in mode eight. You have to keep it going because then mode two is actually in the other direction. And so you gotta, you gotta keep going until you get 90%. So it gets, again, it gets pretty complicated because you have to look at two different directions independently. Uh, but it's not too hard to, to pluck that out of VA. So that's, that's effective modal mass. This is what it's talking about. You have to use as many modes to hit 90%. There it is. Okay, so, yeah. When you say each direction, what is it on some of those weird ones where it goes like up and down? Or same deal, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, those twists, those twists are still, it, it, the twists will pick up participation in the two different directions. And so they'll, they'll both add to it. It's not just one direction. It's, in some cases, the twist is effective in both directions. So you just got to keep, uh, you got to keep going until you get 90% in the X and Y direction. The ups and downs, we don't really do a seismic analysis on it, right? It's kind of something else. But usually if you get too much ups and downs, you've done something ter terribly wrong, like left the middle columns out of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ethan's, Ethan's. Unless you're a, designing a building spanning 72 feet. Yeah. Then, you, then that would be really important. <laughs> that would be really important. Agreed.
Yep. Yep. Or we built it on its side. <laughs> right? Like, didn't Adam should demonstrated that where somebody did that, right? They, they had a gravity acting in the They had it built on its side with the gravity <laughs> acting this way. Anyways, so now we're in. Now we got that. We figured out how many how many uh, modes you need to get to ninety percent. We got our S's. We got you know our different mode shapes, stuff like that. So now we're into the part where we're we're ready to solve this thing, right? So we look at the pseudo response values. I don't know where I got this. I don't know where I got that. This is a. Is this the one? Is this Bose? Is this El Centros? I don't know what this is. This is a response vector, right? So it's a response vector. I don't know where I got it. I'll have to figure that out. I don't know if I got my notes. Anyways, that's a response vector. So at this point, I look at mode one, mode two, and mode three, and I, I calculate what my A1, A2, and A3 are. And in this case, my, they're all, let me see, where did, where did I get this? Is that M? Is that backup man matrix? All Which M? That point five eight seven. What point five eight seven? Uh, A1. Oh, uh, no, I'll, I'll say with that. That's coming off the response vector. That's right here. Oh, okay. Um, up above, if you only use the first two modes and only use those, it's M, and total, then it, you won't get to 98%. But if you use all three modes in the total? Yeah, you're, you're, like, what, you're, what you're looking for, Amanda, is how many modes do you need to get to 90% of the total mass? So the total mass stays stays put, right? So that's it's the overall. So you can calculate it by adding mode one, mode two, and mode three together, or you get that same answer if I take this one plus this one plus this one, just the total mass, right? In this case, it's two point point two five nine plus point two five nine plus point one two nine is my total mass. This isn't even in this isn't even in or or even better that guy plus that guy plus that guy. So, As, when, so when you go to say you only need the first two modes, you don't change the total. No. Nope. Nope. Yep. The total stays the same. Total is is the total in real world, right? The total in the real world is is maybe the easiest way to think about it, right? Okay. So then, right here, this is Bozeman's. This is Bozeman's. This is the same one you use for your homework. Is that correct? No, no. We did an El Cedro response vector. We made our own. But like when you did your homework problem, this is, this is, you've, this is you've given up. This is you've given up. And it's, right? When you did the homework problem where we did the equivalent lateral force procedure on the structure, it was this guy. Wasn't it? Sure. You are just supposed to remember, Amanda, because it's supposed to be burned into your head. I'd say that was about the slope. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, look at that. Yeah, right here. Oh, there it is, right there. SDS, SD1, and TL. 0. 0.58, 0. 0.32, and, and 6. It, it is that. It is that. It is this. It's the Bozeman response spectra. Did you just, did you just, hmm? It is, it is, it is. Probably. It's close. <laughs> it's close? Straight farther and farther. It's close. You're right, it is a little different. But... But it, yeah, but, so, but anyways, it is a response vector. So at this point, what I do, right, and this is, this is G, or it, Excel, this is the pseudo acceleration in G. This is, oh, 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 oh. how these work, right? This is A and G's, and this is the period down below, right? And so what I do is I come in and I look at mode one. Mode one has a period of 0.387. So I look at this thing, I say 0 0.387. That's going to be right here. Beep. Right, let me read that across. And that's 0 0.587 for this particular problem. Okay. Then I do that th same thing for mode two. My mode two now, oh, I, I put that in the wrong spot. <laughs> 387, that's this. Oh, oh no. Uh oh. Okay. Hold on. I did it backwards. I need to do the first one's going to be to the right. 0.387. 
Let's be like right here. All right, and then you look at mode two, that's 0.117, so that's like here-ish. Right, and the last one is 0.121, which is gonna be like here. -ish. Yeah, they all hit the top. That's where the 0.587 comes from, Mike. Right. They're all just right there. They all hit, they're all in this like short period area, this constant acceleration component. And so they all end up being 0.587. So that's my A1, A2, and A3, right? And it's just, it's kind of a bad example because I didn't, it'd be nice to have hit one over here, like a higher period so that you would have picked up a, a different one. But that's, it is what it is. So all of our A's are 0.587. I take those and I divide by omega 1 squared for each one of those, and that gives me my D's, my capital D's, 0 0.86, 0 0.18, and 0 0.085. That's my capital, my capital D for displacements. Okay. I should also point out that this R over I equal to 1.0. For whatever reason I'm doing this, we're just doing this with an R value of equal to one and an importance value of equal to one, right? The, the, the difference would be you would modify your response vector by R and I if you were doing this for reals, right? Like if you were actually doing this for, because uh, uh, there's still nonlinear stuff happening, right? Even though we're doing a more advanced method, it's assuming everything's linear, but it's not really linear. It's gonna go nonlinear and we're counting on the, damp with the dampening associated with things yielding, and so like if you have a special moment resistant frame, you get an R of eight, so instead of using this value, instead of using this value of, you know, uh, of R, or 0 0.587, it would be that 0 0.587 G's divided by eight is what you would use there. And so your R, your response vector that you read off of would have that R value in there. Does that make sense to everybody? We're just doing it just for demonstration purposes, assuming that R is equal to one, but it's not. It's going to be like eight or something. Okay? Everybody right with that? Mm? Yeah? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you do too. <laughs> okay. All right, so there we are. Okay, that's what our D values are. Now we have to come back into the real world. Once we're, we, we have that D and we want to calculate displacements per mode per floor, I then multiply phi times Q and phi times... V is our, our mode shape, gamma is the gamma we calculated above, and D is what we just got right there. So trying to figure out the displacements for mode one, this is mode shape one, multiplied by gamma in this case, which is negative 0 0.738, and my D that I calculated up there, which is 0 0.86, and so there we go. 0 0.379, 0 0.827, and 1.21. So that's inside of mode one, what our displacements are. This is... Mode one. Right, so its display shape would look like this. Oh, hold on. like this, like this, like this. And this value here would be 1.21. This would be 0 0.827 and 0 0.379. Mode one. They do the same thing for our mode two. Right? I don't have the values in there, but you would do the same. You do mode shape two, what it looked like, multiplied by gamma for mode two, and then what we got for D up above, and you get that. And there you would get that negative point zero eight nine zero point four five in this one. Negative 0 0.0899, 0 0.045, and 0 0.045. That's mode shape 2 displacement. And then 3, we're going 88, negative 0 0.098. I know too. All 
right? So that's display shape like that. That's mode one, mode two, and mode three's displacement. Okay. Yeah, you'd be the center of it. Yeah, you'd be doing the center of mass of the stuff. Right. In this case, right, it's a, it's a little different. And we really don't have to worry about mode three, right? Tra technically, yes. Right. <laughs> According to the code, yep, you wouldn't. Yeah, you would. You would just ignore that mode three because you didn't need to do it. Right. Again, not doing this by hand. But when you're, when you're summing up, I mean, this is happening, all this stuff we're doing is happening behind the scenes in, in, in whatever program you're using. Yeah? How did you get the value of the level one or mode three? Oops, wrong. Oh, yeah, right here. Oh, and the top oh did I do it backwards? <laughs> I was so proud of that. I was, as I was going through, I was like, I fucking did it. I did it. I did it without messing up. <laughs> I fucking... Uh, it's just that one. The level three is the only one wrong. I was so proud of myself, too. 0 0.00823. I did, and, and I also tried to make it. I, when I f drew these, I made it really small because it was 0 0.008. I was really proud of myself, but then I wrote the number back. Okay, now this gets a little bit weird. Now, I, we said before about you look inside the mode first and then you combine them afterwards. The one exception would be if you're looking for displacements, right? So that's one of the things you have to check is drifts and displacements. In that case, you do just do the square of the sum of the squares of these guys, right? You don't, it doesn't really make, if I wanna look at floor one, floor two, and floor three, the, the overall displacements for this, I don't, I don't. Is that one right? Is that really the, it's right, I checked. Okay. Right. It seems like it's, anyways, yeah, I, I, it doesn't really make sense to look at inside the mode for the displacements first. This is inside the mode for the displacement. So you do just do the squares and some of the squares as you go across, which is a little weird because 1.21, it's actually 1.21 to the right. The other one's negative to that side and the other one's positive to that side. But for displacements, this is, again, this, this method is, has holes and this is one of the holes. So to get the, cat, the overall, I just do, these guys squared, this guy squared, plus this guy squared, this guy squared, this guy, 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 this but if you're asking for the overall displacements, you do this. But if you're, at, if you're looking at drifts, you would look at here compared to here, and then you'd have these two drifts, and then here and here, and you'd have those two drifts, and then you'd do the square of the sum of the squares of the drifts afterwards. Okay? So then, there's that. Okay? If you want the equivalent static forces per mode, these you need, the equivalent static forces you need because you need to calculate axial loads, moments, shears, and stuff like that throughout the structure. So there's a couple ways to do it. The easiest way to do it is you just do your S that we had above and you multiply it by A, right? Or you could do your K multiplied by your U's from up above. Either one, you get the same answer. K's times U's or S's times A's. And so in this case, I just did S's times A's. This is what S1 is. This is what my A is. I have to multiply by 386.4 because my A is in units of uh, G, so I need to get it into uh, the, the right units there. And so that's what I get for this. F1, F2, you do the same thing, and F3, you do that one. So what this would look like, see if I can do this correctly this time. Probably not. Like this. 41.2. Fifty-six point five. Well, almost did it. Almost twenty-five point eight. This is what F one would do. And this one here would be negative fourteen point seven. 
14.7 and 14.7. And the last one, 2.85, negative 12.5, and this last one, 2.85, oh, 18.2. So those are the equivalent static forces that you would apply in this thing. Okay. Oh, there's something I was gonna say about these. Uh, I was gonna say something about the uh, What are the units on it kips. K, I, uh, I did put a K right here, K. So each one of those are kips. K, 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 oh, K. Okay. Ah, uh, ba, 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 ba. I thought I had some statement. Uh, let's do that right here. Let's see. So what we're doing here is FI F I F I F I is trying to force structure structure into shape shape it would be in if obtained from full dynamic analysis. That FI is, is doing it, it's pushing it into the shape that it would be in if it went through a full dynamic analysis. And this is where, is where distribution of forces come from in ELF, an equivalent lateral force procedure. And that K value that you have, right, that if, you, if the distribution of forces is either like linear right up if everything's, if everything's the same, this is, it's mostly mode one, is what that equivalent lateral force procedure looks like, right? Ours was linear almost the whole way, except for in this case, the mass on the third floor is half the mass of the other floors. That's why it doesn't follow that same, that same linear, like if this was the same, if this was the same mass as the other two floors, this would just keep getting bigger like that. It would just be a distribution, just a linear distribution, and that's what the, the code does. This is about what the equivalent lateral force procedure would give you, the same distribution. When you start picking up the bigger periods, then mode two starts to become more of a factor. And mode two, you can see, has a little whip in it, right? It has a push this way and a whip back that direction. And so that K value is trying to capture some of that whip. That's why, and then it would give you, if everything was equal, it would give you a distribution that had like a kind of a whip up at the top. And that's trying to capture this extra little whip that you're picking up in mode two. That's why there's that, that extra little K value in there. Okay. So then the last step is just to calculate the base shear, which is to add those things up vertical. We'll pick up from that last next, uh, next step. On, on Wednesday, I'll bring in an assignment, which is just pulling it out in v VA. You can, I'm going to show you how to do it in VA, and then you go do it in VA. It takes like 15 minutes. The whole assignment. It goes really fast. Yeah. Yeah. It, I just want you to open up VA and like see how it works. And then, yeah.
If you're smart, it takes you 15 minutes. Uh, it's probably an hour. Maybe an hour. Uh, Maybe an hour. Uh,